Welcome to this week's episode of Zero to a Million, brought to you by Unstack. I'm your host, Zach Rigo, and today I'm joined by Anila Ednani, co-founder of HabitAware, a smart bracelet that uses custom gesture detection and awareness training to help people with trichotillomania. Struggled through that that final word there, uh, Anila, but I made it, and I appreciate you joining us today. I'm so grateful for the time to be able to share our company journey and raise awareness of what trichotillomania actually <laughs> even is. Yeah, no. So uh, take us through the journey. I guess take us through your background and then we'll get to the point where obviously you founded Habit Aware and, and started to develop a product to solve this problem. Yep. Yeah. So um, Habit Aware really started out of personal need. I have trichotillomania, which is a medical mental health condition uh, that essentially is compulsive hair pulling. So it can be rooted in stress and anxiety, even in boredom. So different different mm-hmm. states of mental discomfort. And essentially what happens is when our mind is restless, our hands get restless. So our hands will, uh, you know, pull at our hair, pick at our skin, bite our nails, that kind of thing, where those issues can then become greater in our mind in terms of creating vicious cycle of negative self-speak. So I started pulling in my early tweens. Uh, post-puberty, had really bushy eyebrows, was also going through a lot of stressful things in my life, a little bit of bullying in, in elementary school. And then in high school, my father felt sick with cancer. And it just became this thing that felt good in the moment where I would pull out an eyebrow to kind of clean up and make my eyebrows not so bushy, but then it just felt good. And so it just became the go-to for me to to just pull. And I didn't realize it was happening because it's a very trance-like behavior. Um, And it was a soothing mechanism. It was the way that my body and my brain chose to cope with the stress I was under. And in college and work life, I just got really good at pushing it down and hiding it to the point where I was fooling my friends with, you know, a black eye pencil and they would compliment me on how gorgeous my eyebrows were when they were really just drawn on. Uh, And I was really fooling myself because I didn't really know what was happening and I was just kind of ignoring it and not, not getting to a point of healing and just living in the sense of fear of being found out, of being caught, of always wondering if someone was looking at me, were they looking at me because they could sense something was wrong that, oh, I didn't have any eyelashes or, you know, something was wrong with my eyebrows or were they looking at me and listening to me because I had something to say. And so I lived in fear for a really long time until a few years ago, my husband caught me without eyebrows. So I was walking into the bathroom after a long night of pulling. Um, and I was going in to get my black eye pencil and I bumped into him and he just kind of squinted at me and was like, where are your eyebrows? And that was kind of a deer in headlights moment of, hmm. I, I didn't even know what to say, but finally it came out. I, I pulled them out. I pulled my hair out and, um, you know, this is the person that you promise in sickness and in health. But I just was so afraid and so ashamed and so felt so inwardly guilty and wrong that I didn't want to give him or anyone else reason to say, oh, yeah, you're wrong, you know, and so I hid. Um, but, of course, he met me with compassion, with love, with support, and then he started doing research online to better understand what this was and the shame that I was harboring. And then one day we're just sitting on the couch, we're watching TV and that's one of my triggers, just sitting and doing nothing, that boredom. And I was pulling and he just gently grabbed my hand and that was the aha moment of, oh, if I just had something that notified (laughs) me, could it help me? And could it not be you because I want to punch you? (laughs) You Like when he he grabbed my hand, I was just like, you don't tell me what to do kind of feeling. Um, But when we empower ourselves to take that, awareness and that control, we can make this, this positive life change happen. So that's what we built. Yeah. Well, that's what we built. Well, I, I love that you found it out of need. I mean, obviously it's a, it's, it is a disease that is, you know, rampant around folks that have any levels of anxiety or stress inducing moments. And I think it's really important uh, that people are aware of these habits. How aware were you of, of, you know, the disease and had you done that research that your husband started diving into, or were you just, mm-hmm you know, kind of out of sight, out of mind, trying to, trying to not think about it. Yeah. So when I was growing up, you know, 10 to 20, 22, 23, I didn't know that it was a mental health condition. I thought there was something wrong with me that I couldn't control what I was doing. Like 
I, I would I would pull and then I would look in the mirror and I would literally tell myself, Anila, what's wrong with you? Why can't you stop? You're so ugly. Why are you making yourself ugly? Like all of this negative, um, critical talk. And it's only in my 20s I finally went to <clears throat> Dr. Yahoo and typed in, why am I pulling out my hair? And then that's like, you know, we didn't have internet when I was 10, but we right. had it. <laughs> um, and so... I found out it was a medical condition, trichotillomania, but that in and of itself was not, that was also really daunting and scary because it was also still, you know, early 2000s. We're not talking about mental health the way we talk about it today. There's still a lot of stigma around mental health. Back then, growing up, 80s, 90s, mental health on TV was straight jackets and padded rooms, right? And so this was not that, but that's, of course, where I, I took took it in my mind and so it didn't give me peace it gave me even more stress in a sense right. that um and so i continued hiding like even more reason to hide right like oh my gosh um not really understanding what that meant and so it was a really hard time and and i kind of once I knew, I started googling you know researching online and trying to find stuff out but never really clicked for me what it was or how to stop or it was, I was so focused on hiding it and concealing it on making sure no one found out um, that it didn't ever really even occur to me. Like, could I, could I switch and try to focus on healing? Right. right. It's all about concealing. And now I realize that it's the secret that was making me sick, that, that shame and that hiding and all the energy and time that we spend, you know, I call it the most common disorder you've never heard of because hair pulling, skin picking, and nail biting, there's a perception that because it's our hands, it's our fault, that we're in control. Yeah. And so we, we don't talk about it because when we do, we get, ew, that's gross, just stop. And it's not that simple. And so when we get met with that sort of uh, barrier, that sort of you know negative reaction, we hole up. And so even though it's so common, it's only now in the last few years that people are talking about it. You'll see it mentioned in beauty magazines and women's health magazines. But years ago, like my story is my story, but so many people have lived the same way of hiding and not knowing that it was a thing and that they were alone. And now slowly, thanks to the magic of the Internet, finding community. Yeah. So you, you went from hiding it to building a business about it and joining podcasts to talk about it, which is, which is amazing. What a, what a transition, right? Uh, you had the aha moment of your husband, you know, grabbing your, your hand or wrist to kind of pull it away. What was the product development life cycle from that moment, which, it, you know, you can't build other husbands to sit on the couch and pull the arm away or whatever that, that motion was uh, to get to, you know, creating a product that was, you know, able to be sold. Yep. Yeah. So from there, the, the idea really was a smart bracelet that could use uh, sensors to recognize when you were engaging in these behaviors. But mm. Samir has a business background and, you know, some technical applied physics, science, engineering background, but not what we specifically needed for this. And I have a marketing communications advertising background. So we had parts of the puzzle, but not all of it. Um, thankfully, we, we were living, we were living in still live in Minneapolis at the time. Um, we had just moved there a few years prior. And to make friends, we uh, actually went to tech meetups because I was super interested in the intersection of advertising and technology. But that's sort of how we started making friends. And then once we came up with this idea, I had people that I could go to and say, hey, do you know someone that could help us build this? And it was incredible. I had to get over sharing my startup secret as well as my hair pulling secret, but folks would come up to me and, you know, whisper, I pull out my hair too, or look at my nails. I can't stop biting them. And so at the same time that we were trying to find our two technical hmm. co-founders, John and Kirk, we were also amassing just this massive amount of support from the community as well as alpha testers and right. things like that, that, that really helped us through those early stages. Um, and then that's how we met John and Kirk, who are two technical co-founders on the hardware and the software side. And together we built prototype after prototype after prototype. 
And when the, this hypothesis of if I know I'm playing with my eyebrows and I get a vibration like I just did, <laughs> can I do something with that information? Can I put my hand down? Can I take that moment to take care of myself? And it was working. So we just kept pushing nights and weekends until in 2016, we got into Hacks, which is a hardware accelerator program. Great. And in 90 days, we pushed it and built the product, did a, a pre-order campaign, was, you know, by that time I was already in the community, just sharing my own journey and, and trying to seek support. And so we started um, just helping the people that we knew to begin. So it's very, like a very close knit community. And then now we're helping tens of thousands of people around the world. We've shipped to 70 plus countries. We also now do peer coaching calls. So we've talked with people in Ghana and Jordan and Australia and Sweden and all over the U.S. and Brazil. And it's just been so amazing to to really take that pain from, you know, I always say 10-year-old Anila just keeps me going because there's other 10-year-olds out there that are feeling that same pain. And we know we can help them. No, that's uh, that's a great story. So product development early on, I'm sure, was somewhat costly. You got into the accelerator. Did you raise funds before you got into the accelerator or were you all bootstrapping all the way up until that point and, and then, you know, trying to raise funds from there? Yeah, we were bootstrapping that entire time. Um, Hacks came in with some investment as well. And around great. that same time, we were able to raise from local angels and friends and family. Awesome. Um, and then we've we've received three uh, S- SBIR, small business research grants from uh, two from the National Institute of Health and Sorry, one from the National Institute of Mental Health and two from the National Science Foundation. Um, because I believe that, you know, I believe that there's understanding at that level of the gravity of these situations. And so um, that funding has helped us develop the product further and allow us to reach the markets that we're trying to reach, the, the community that we're trying to help. Incredible. And you mentioned there was a, a campaign that y'all did that was a, a pre-order campaign. Was there a platform that y'all used for that or were you just doing it through communities? Yeah, we did like pre-order campaign. You know, typically when you say pre-order campaign, you think of like Indiegogo or Kickstarter. Yeah. Um, because there was so much shame and there still is so much shame about these conditions, we actually did the pre-order campaign on our own website. Cool. We just didn't want to out people, you know, because sometimes those platforms yeah. are tied to your Facebook and you just don't want to be, you know, unknowingly outing someone that, hey, this person just bought this thing. So oh. that was kind of our concern there that we didn't want people feeling like um, that they that they wanted to hide. That, okay, interesting. You know, no, that, yeah. that makes sense. And and how did you market that? I guess, we, you know, a lot of folks do go to the Kickstarters or the Indiegogos. If they wanted to do a pre-order campaign on their own, you know, that's yeah. that's challenging and potentially costly as well. The benefits of, of the Kickstarters of the world is they're driving traffic already. Uh, how did y'all go about acquiring traffic and building the demand? Yeah, so we started blogging a lot. Um, Great. And, we, and we did Facebook ad marketing to kind of start collecting emails. So on the marketing side, it's very much people need to find out about you somehow, right? So our our our, our very top line is like a, like how I found out search, right? Yep. Internet search. Uh, because people are not going to their treatment professionals for these things. They're going to Dr. Yahoo, Dr. Google, WebMD, that kind of thing. So we try to leverage those platforms for marketing, advertising. And then there's a lot of online um, communities. So we did Facebook marketing at the very beginning to capture email addresses to say, hey, this is coming. This is built by someone like you. Um, we believe it can help you. And we started building our community through email capture um, so that once we were ready for that Kickstarter-esque campaign, so Kickstarter is now just a verb. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good for them. Yeah. Um, you know, we had people in our community that we had been emailing and sharing our story, sharing the journey, bringing them on that journey with us uh, so that when we were finally ready to do the pre-order campaign, we had, um, you know, that email saying, we're live now. And folks were just so excited and so supportive. Even to this day with COVID and all the things happening with supply chain issues, just folks are so understanding 
of the pain we are going through from that production process uh, because we've taken them on this journey because I don't view them as customers. I view them as our team family, right? Our community, our, our, I just, living in the pain that I know that they are living in too. I want them to make sure, I want to make sure that they understand all the work and the hard work and the nights and weekends that we still put in um, to make sure that we're building the best product we can to help them overcome these conditions. Great. So after the launch of the the campaign, uh, how successful was that, first of all? And did it meet y'all's expectations? And then and then once the product was live and you were holding inventory, you know, what were those next six months to a year like and what were your best channels to kind of scale and make sure you're doing, you know, sell through and getting the product out to folks? Yeah, it was immensely su- successful. You know, obviously, it's a very niche market. It's it's, it's kind of this growing pains of people may not even know they have the condition, right? I didn't know I had a condition. And so there's a a huge education curve for folks. So it's not, uh, oh, I'm going to see an ad and I'm just going to click buy right away. There's a little bit of learning and and, um, encouragement along the way to get folks there that, hey, you know, you need to be ready for this. Here's how we support you. Here's how we help you. We have a wealth of knowledge. We have people on the team that are experts in this and that have lived through it. And so the pre-order campaign was immensely successful. And then folks, you know, were having a good experience and start sharing it. They would share it with their psychologists. And we started doing outreach to psychologists. So then it was sort of a two-way street of either a patient was telling their psychologist or a psychologist was telling their patient. So that word of mouth is really strong for us in the community. And then there's a a few major nonprofits that um, we've been able to attend one of their annual conferences for the last five or six years. Um, I think during COVID it was kind of canceled, but they managed to still pull together virtual stuff at the last minute. Um, And so just being part of the community, being there, seeing people, helping them in person, set up their bracelets, because the way it works is you have to train it for your specific behavior and record that motion. And, you know, there's some nuance to that in terms of the gesture detection is only good as good as the movement you give it. So, and it's designed for a very uh, specific kind of small repetitive scanning motion. So um, we actually offer free video training calls to make sure that you're getting set up for success because everyone's on a different spectrum of (laughs) technical savviness, if you will. Yeah. Um, So we like to support folks all along that journey uh, and then continue with our emails, our blogs, you know, our Instagram is another uh, big tool for us. We're starting to dabble in TikTok. Um, I think one of the things for me is getting over my own fears of of being on a platform like that because it's very, very personal. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, um, uh, so that's one of the, the humps that I'm trying to get over is, is sharing more of my personal journey. Um because I think it's important for people to see that life is a mix of constant struggle and constant, you know, it's like an up and down there's struggles, but then there's also these like good points in your life. Right. And so how do you maintain balance throughout all of that? Um, yeah. I think there's two things that, that y'all have done that are interesting, especially in the early stage. And that is a dedication to content and a dedication to community And those are, you know, those are challenging. They're, they are not short term providing rewards. It's not an instant gratification. You set up a Facebook campaign and you see an order come in because someone clicked Mm -hmm. the ad and bought. It is, you know, an annuity that you are investing in and hopefully it's compounding over time. And, you know, that's something that Unstack spend a ton of time on and we invest a lot of time in and, and a lot of B2B clients, you know, or mm-hmm. customer softwares or, or other B2B businesses do, but you don't see it as often in the, in the direct to consumer market. So I, I love that y'all have done that and, and done it successfully. And I think your, your point was spot on. Like there is a huge education piece of this mm-hmm. before anyone is going to make a, you know, hundred to $150 purchase. Mm-hmm. Um, what have y'all invested in? you know, more recently that's been successful as the brand and, 
you know, the awareness has grown. Are there any channels you mentioned? TikTok is something that you're you're starting to think about. But are there any channels that y'all are just continually investing in or seeing rapid growth within? Yeah. So um, we've been trying to leverage Facebook a little bit more um, with just advertising, uh, trying to see, and then the investment there really is bringing on an ad agency, a Facebook ad agency that can really do that for us because we were kind of doing it on our own and sort of setting it and forgetting it. And, uh, you know, having someone that's a little bit more active in there that can guide us on creative and language and, and actually really hone the metrics um, has been really helpful. And then really email has been, our number one method, I think, in terms of that we've been focusing on in terms of um, nurturing people through, like nurturing that relationship. Uh, And then Google ads as well, search ads, um, again, bringing on an outside consultant expert to help us make sure we're we're set up for success there. Um, And then now slowly starting to dabble in SMS, haven't really started leveraging it yet, but starting to... You know, I always thought that, oh, my phone number is like, that's the last thing, you know, and now I'm I'm noticing more and more companies are asking for it or using it or, um, you know, like, like a local one local restaurant here I signed up for, I get a notification whenever it's the birthday, like that kind of thing. So starting to figure out that I think will be interesting, uh, especially as, you know, we, we, especially as we kind of lose the ability to track some of the other um, metrics, if you will. Uh, So SMS, I really like long form. I personally like to write. So blogging and email newsletter are kind of the go-to. Like I think that's sort of the other thing is that we tend to stick to what we know. So um, those are kind of the things that, that we find working for us. It's really about showing people, hey, you can do this. How do I know? Because here's someone in our team family right. that's done it. Here's their story. Here's their journey. Here's what's worked for them. Um, and then even though it's not really scalable, a lot of what we do is one-to-one. Not a lot of what we do, but you know, we do some one-to-one work in terms of peer coaching and things like that, and we're working to kind of okay, how can we scale that? So converting that peer coaching into an online course uh, instead so that we can reach more people, right? So everything always starts with, let's test it out. Let's do it one-to-one. And then let's see if it's working for folks. How can we um, make it such that, okay, we can do uh, an online course and then we can have peer coaching for someone who still wants more or needs more information or needs more encouragement or needs more ongoing support. Okay. Love it. A couple questions, uh, starting from the beginning. So you mentioned Facebook and Google ads and, and working with an expert on those two channels. Did y'all build test internally to kind of get some validation that, Hey, these will work. I know you mentioned lead acquisition strategy early on, but you know, getting someone to give you some, an email through lead ads is very different than you know, trying to build, you know, a return on ad spend through, you know, direct conversions or, or kind of a direct paid campaign. Uh, did you invest in it prior to test before you went out to an agency or did you go to the agency first? Uh, we did some of it on our own and then we've used like different agencies at different points. So right now it's kind of a mix of lead generation and then retargeting on, okay. you know, on those. Um, and then, you know, as soon as you get to the site, there's the pop up that says some sort of, you know, nice message of join our newsletter, join our community right. so that we can continue nurturing. Um, it's very weird for me to talk about it in this way because I, I think that's kind of the, the discomfort I have with it is I, it's, it's not an email address, right? It's a human being. Yep. Totally. <laughs> and, but, but I think like when you were saying before about some of these other B2B, B2C companies, that's how they think about it. They think about it as like, oh, I have X thousand number of email addresses. And for us and for me and my mentality, it's, it's just, it's very hard for me to talk about it in this way because that's just right. not how I think about it. If that makes sense, fair. Like, no, it's, totally it's fair. Human being, I'm hope I'm hoping to help is how I see it. Right, you got to use some avenue to educate them, and and email is yeah. a great one. You mentioned that. Who are you using for email marketing as a platform? We are now on Clavio or Clavio. Awesome. Clavio, yep, yeah. So we just yeah. uh, 
this will release in a few weeks, but a few weeks back, we interviewed their CEO, Andrew, uh, and yeah. he, he talked a lot about uh, the difference in, in how consumers view giving their email versus giving SMS. So it, it plays right mm-hmm. into like your internal feelings and how you're thinking about it. But I think there is a um, there is a place and something that he said that actually resonated quite a bit with me uh, was depending upon the brand, people are more inclined to give different information. So you yeah. mentioned a restaurant, local restaurant. You love it. You know, you probably go often. You're willing to give them your phone number. You know, some brand you've never heard of. You might not willing to give them your phone number, but you give them an email. It might not even be your personal email. It might be some email you use to acquire promotions. Um, But there's this really interesting thought process that people go through. And and obviously, SMS being a big growth channel, I think, in the future, especially with changes to iOS 15 and and how they're going to change how people use the email app is going to be very interesting. Uh, Speaking with, you know, along some of those, you know, you mentioned remarketing, um, you mentioned Facebook remarketing. Have you all had any challenges more recently with the changes to iOS? Is that something that you have worked through and you feel like is rebounding or would love some some of your experience there over the last few months? Yeah, like the change with iOS and sort of not being able to track so much. I think it really just came down to we don't know what the numbers mean. Right? Totally. Like, we, we can see numbers, but we don't know what 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 the truth is behind them. Um, so yeah, it's been a little tricky, but I think we're slowly starting to see some rebounds there in terms of like, uh, engagement with the ads conversion, um, and sort of cost per lead or cost per click going back down. Um, it's, it's, it's never easy to just say, this is the formula because it's constantly changing. The algorithms are constantly changing (laughs) or, you know, just different things are happening. Like in, during the political campaigns, you know, we were getting so drowned out. We just said, let's just turn everything off for a little bit. Hmm. Um, that kind of thing that our costs were going way up for impressions that in the, you know, in that time period. So you really do have to be monitoring it, uh, and, and making sure that things are working and turning things off, turning things on, turning things, you know, changing language and all that stuff. It's just, it's just also something that if you're a very small team, you know, it's hard to do. So it's really been helpful to have uh, experts support us in that. Totally. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of uh, e-commerce brands are hesitant to work with an agency, but it is, you know, when you find those experts in their, you know, subject matter and you focus on, Hey, I'm going to give this agency this and you know this agency, this, it takes a huge load off of the team. And mm-hmm. the ROI is, is more often than not there. If you're, if you're tactical to who you work with, what are you most excited about uh, with the business and, and its growth and go to market strategy over the next six to 12 months? I am most excited about supporting the community. So one of the things our hope we hope to do is actually open up a community platform nice. um, in, in the coming weeks, uh, body focused, repetitive behavior awareness week. So trichotillomania falls under this broader mental health category of body focused, repetitive behaviors. So that's hair pulling, skin picking, nail biting and other things. Um, so our hope is to launch that in October during that awareness week and really be able to connect um and help support people on their journey more one-to-one, a little bit more real time and also offer courses to help them on their own time. Love it. Community is huge. And Mm -hmm. and I think you've done an amazing job of nurturing it and creating it. And I think the content strategy investing in that early is a, is a game changer uh, and love that you are investing it often love that you love creating content. Cause a lot of folks don't, uh, I like creating video and audio content, which is why I have a podcast. I hate blogging. It takes me a very long time to do it. I've actually started just putting my uh, AirPods in going for walks with my dog and transcribing it on Google docs to get all my words onto you know paper and then, <laughs> and then turn them into a blog. I hate writing. So I love that you love it. It's hard to find folks that really enjoy that. Yeah, it's a good method. I just, the the audio video, I think for me, it's the technical aspect that is daunting. Um, but there are definitely moments where I wish I could type as fast as my head can think. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So maybe I'll try your dictation method. There you go. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So Anila, thank you so much for joining us today. Where can everyone learn more about Habit Aware and obviously the upcoming community launch as well? Yeah, please uh, visit habitaware.com. And then we're on YouTube, uh, Facebook, Instagram is 
probably our, our hottest spot. They're all at Habit Aware. We also have a Pinterest account um, and a TikTok right now, too, there which we're go. starting to get dip our toes into. Um, and yeah, you can find out more about the community by going to habitaware.com and as well the product and, and lots of other things that we do for it to support the community uh, and sign up for our newsletter. <laughs> Awesome. And SMS, Anila. if you want. And SMS, yes. Yeah, give it a shot. I love it, Anila. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your story today. 